Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Um, thank you all for logging on. We are just waiting because there are a few more people I can see joining us at the moment. So we'll just give them a couple of minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started now. So again, a thank you to you all for logging on this afternoon to join our webinar, uh, preparing your business for re-entry following lockdown, a topic which I think um, everyone's talking about right now. Um, so um, just really to talk you through, first of all, um, for those of you who don't know us already, um, my name's Zoe Lidster um, and I'm from Harwood HR Solutions and we're joined by Duncan Turner also, who I'll hand it over to you in just a moment. Um, so we'll just walk you through the the agenda um, so you know what points we're going to cover off and at the end we will hold a Q&A session so if you've got any questions that crop up during the webinar please do drop them into the chat box uh, and I'll be picking those up so we can try and answer off as many of those um, as possible at the end um, and um, any we don't get round to please don't worry we will answer them for you so we will send out um, a question and answer sheet following this webinar uh, along with the recording um, of it also um, so we really will get round to all of those questions at some point. Um, so I will hand over now to Duncan um, and uh, speak to you shortly. Thanks very much Zoe, welcome everybody. Um, I'm sure you've all um, uh, become fed up with the uh, wordings uh, of, of the, uh, the coronavirus and the lockdown and the furlough and all these sorts of uh, words that we've become familiar with and um and also fed up with so um the good news is that uh there is a light at the end of the tunnel if we choose to uh um think positively uh, and now is the time to start thinking about okay well all that's happened that was all bizarre but how do we actually get back at it so um in the first instance we will uh on this webinar look at planning for returning from lockdown um we will also look at uh, returning to the workplace, what considerations uh, you need to be making for your business and for your employees. Uh, we'll also look at um, returning staff from furlough. So they've been off on furlough for a considerable period of time. So what, what, how do we get them back and what considerations do we need to make? Uh, we'll then go into to a couple of areas that, that are a bit more specific. So um, 
yes, we're going to go back, but there are changes to terms and conditions, changes to to um, the business that we want to make on returning, uh, or regrettably, um, you may need to make redundancies uh, or restructure uh, on returning. So we'll also give you an overview on on what that means and and uh, what you need to to consider. Um, we'll then have a, a period if there are any of, of questions and answers so the more questions that you put into the questions box on the uh, panel the more we'll answer off if you don't have any today don't worry about it you can always follow up with us on email or phone or whatever so we'll also give you a few um, what's next uh, pointers as well so if we move on um, to the next slide uh, planning to return from lockdown so as the government starts to ease lockdown, um, then you need to start planning for how you're going to move forward. So we'll, we'll have seen in the press recently, if you actually ignore the mudslinging between politicians and medical staff, et cetera, in terms of who's to blame, who cares really, it's been awful. Um, and we are all looking forward to getting to the right side of this situation where nobody is becoming ill and, and, and regrettably dying. So. If you ignore all of the news, behind all the news, there are things that are starting to happen um, that the government are pushing for in order to try and get businesses to think about coming back. The first thing is obviously they're sending out information to say, hey, if you're in XYZ sector, it's now safe for you to return. However, if you're in hospitality or uh, if you're a hairdresser, please don't return yet. So you'll see lots of information coming through. Uh, and you'll start to get an understanding as to when the government is suggesting that it's safe for you to return. Actually, for the large majority, um, the general advice and guidance is that it is safe to return, well, not safe to return, but they're advising you to consider returning now as long as you can make it a safe environment. Um, Additionally, and we'll come on to this on another slide, but but there is there is talk about uh, more than talk the suggestion that the furlough scheme is being uh, extended, which is on one hand great news because it provides all business owners with with a longer period of time to benefit from um, the the furlough contribution, um, and they've extended that to the end of July. Um, and they've also suggested that they'll extend it further, um, but on a on a on a on a phased out basis. So we're we're still waiting to understand what that looks like. But they've suggested that organisations need to start contributing to that furlough amount as we head past the end of July. Um, and at the moment, all we know is that they're going to make it possible for people to be furloughed. Uh, whilst uh, coming in on a part-time basis, which hasn't been available before, um, and um, that employees can still expect to receive 80% of their salary. However, organisations will need to contribute towards it. So good news is furlough is, is extended. Um, uh, the bad news is um, the, the longer people are, that are on furlough, the harder it is to, to get them back for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but the headline I would take from it is that, look, it's there if you need it, but start planning now about what your business needs to look like and what you need to do in order to get back to business uh, with a viable uh, organisation. So um, the first thing that, that we, we're asking uh, people to think about is what does your organisation look like today and what does your organisation need to look like? if you are to come out of this lockdown period and have a viable business. We are being told, uh, albeit it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, we are being told that we're about to step into some form of recession. I think that probably uh, is sensible advice. We don't know for how long, but um, we need to start planning for a business world with potentially reduced revenue um and therefore you need to pivot your business so um 
it's different for every single organization it, and, and it doesn't impact every single organization but start thinking today about what your organization needs to look like do you need as many staff the staff that you have are they are is the structure correctly do you have the right number of the right roles uh, are the uh, positions uh, in your business being paid correctly are they being rewarded correctly uh, all of these questions that might not automatically uh, be linked to uh, the current situation there's an opportunity now to really re-engineer and reset your business going forward so that's what does your organization look like secondly who will return so there is uh, also an opportunity to stagger your return so um, you can bring uh, people off furlough back into the business uh, and retain and keep some members of staff on furlough um, there are things you need to consider with that like with all things uh, selection you need to make sure that you're selecting in the right way and therefore what that means is you're selecting roles rather than individuals so if you've assessed your business and uh, I'll make some roles up and you've got a sales team of six and you only need six sales team members back um, then you need to make sure that you're going through a proper process of selecting which sales people you bring back on which you and, and, and those that you leave on furlough um, and that selection criteria is very similar to redundancy selection criteria and again if you need any help and advice and guidance with that then just reach out to us but uh, just be careful um, so selecting somebody for the wrong reasons could leave you open to a claim down the line let's hope that people don't do that but you know um, our experience tells us that where there's where there's an opportunity there's always somebody prepared to throw a claim in so just be careful when selecting who to, to return uh, when you do return people from furlough what do you need to do well you need to write to them you need to give them due notice etc etc so again uh, when you're planning for who you want to return from furlough um, then there are considerations um, with that also um, what changes to the workplace do you need to make well um, there are and, and again we, we'll go through a, a slide on this in a moment but there are certainly um, health and safety um, considerations to make now this is, is completely new world advice guidance and legislation and we're learning about this all the time however the government have recently uh, sent out guidance on the types of things that they would expect organizations to take into account when returning their employees to the workplace. Um, there is um, guidance around uh, uh, organizations with more than five employees having to do a full risk assessment um, prior to people returning. Our advice is that um, you should complete a risk assessment on your business um, taking into consideration the government advice and guidance and prepare a um, a paper or guide set of guide notes for your employees to consider read digest prior to them returning to the workplace and potentially to sign up to um, in order to protect yourself um, not all of the government guidance laid out is going to be possible to deliver in your workplace dependent on the size of your operation and facilities and premises however you need to consider all that you can in terms of maintaining a, uh, a safe working environment um, so what changes to the workplace do you need to make um, Will you continue to furlough some employees? We've covered uh, um, restructuring. Um, uh, restructuring and, and redundancies are often considered one and the same. It, not not true. They can be linked. So restructuring typically is we don't we've got the right sort of number of people, but we haven't got them in the right spots. So do you need to restructure your organisation in order to make it effective, efficient, and viable? Um, or do you need to make redundancies? Um, so um, you have too many uh, roles, you have too much cost in your business, uh, do you need to make redundancies? Uh, and as I say, it can be linked to restructuring or it can just be as simple as we don't need the people that, that, that we have. 
So if we go to the next slide, um, which is returning to the workplace. We'll go into this into a little bit more, more detail. So uh, returning to the workplace, what considerations do you need to make? Okay, so there, there's there's guidance, quite comprehensive guidance from, from the government, and we're pretty sure this will be continually reviewed and checked and updated as we as we navigate our way through, and also as the risk to the country starts to hopefully diminish, uh, subject to some of these uh, second, third waves that they're talking about. But uh, the current guidance is um, that, firstly, uh, you need to defend against the spread of COVID-19. So um, when you are re-entering or uh, asking people to return to your uh, place of work, uh, it's doing all that you can in order to defend against the spread of COVID-19. Um, so um, in order to do that, it's taking all of the necessary guidance and advice given in order to, to make your workplace a safe environment. Um, but also, if you have employees that return to work that are showing any signs whatsoever uh, of the uh, disease, then uh, you should be sending them home immediately, especially in this early stage. It's fair, and it's a fair point to make here as well, by the way, that the government are still saying at the moment that please arrange for employees to work from home if it's practically possible to do so. So what they're saying is please, please arrange for them to work from home unless you have absolutely no option, therefore bring them into the workplace, but make sure you adapt the workplace uh, to suit. Um, so how do you defend against the spread of COVID-19? Well, um, you need to minimise close contact and risk to employees. So all employers, as we've already said, should carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment uh, to assess and manage the risk of COVID-19. Uh, the objective of this is to identify sensible measures to control the risk in the workplace. Um, and whilst look, at the moment there's no requirement for you to do this if you have less than five employees, we're advising that you do a risk assessment um, and publish your risk, risk assessment uh, and make it available to your employees if possible before you go back so you get buy into it and things that you probably without question need to include in your plan is frequency of hand washing advice and guidance um, working from home wherever possible um, and then within the workplace, making all reasonable efforts to implement social distancing, if you can, the two metre apart rule to, to try and maintain that if you can. Um, dependent again on size of building and, 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 and your facilities, you may want to have uh, one way systems of traffic around the building. Um, but as I say, it's only if it's feasible and practical for you to do so. Um, also, um, staggering um, uh, times for lunch breaks, staggering entry to the building times, exit from the building times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all this type of um, advice and guidance is available, but. I, I have to say it's all dependent on what is physically possible and feasible in your business, which is why we're saying that carrying out your own risk assessment and publishing it at the start of this is quite key uh, because that will always also um, define and will tell your employees what you have considered and what you're not considering and for, and for good reason. So another key here is is splitting of team shifts um so if, if it again if it's something that you're able to do having split shift patterns making sure that there's a gap between one shift coming in and one shift going out is uh is is good practice uh there's talk about what they call an air gap uh, which is that delayed shift changeover uh, and potentially full cleaning and disinfecting of shared equipment uh, all of this, by the way, is 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 ideal scenario. And as I say, if you can do it, fantastic. If you can't, it's just taking what bits from this that you can implement and putting it into your plan to get employees to understand what you're doing. 
Um, information and training for all employees. So um, there is a, uh, for good reason, there is there is advice and guidance being provided to you guys to say, look, actually you should train your employees. Don't assume they know everything. So um, you should, on, on re-entry or prior to re-entry, you should be training your employees on the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 so they know how to how to detect it. Uh, I know we all have become mini experts. Um, well, no one's a blooming expert, but uh, we've all become experts from reading the press, watching the news, watching the updates on a on every evening. But don't assume that everybody has been. So, so uh, train people up with what they need to know. Train people up for the cleaning routines. Um, uh, train people up to to know what to do should they feel unwell in the morning and and, and uh, they're thinking about coming into work, they need to understand that no, if you have XYZ symptoms, you shouldn't be attending work, but please give us a call to let us know, etc. Uh, train them up to, to understand that it's now very much part of their duties to clean their own workstations with the with the uh, tools that we that you will provide for them um rubbish disposal including and obviously things like tissues or uh, things that could carry the, the the bug um any guidance you can give them on travel restrictions um and um etc so and all of this uh, will uh we we advise should be part of your re-entry plan so you do your risk assessment just to summarize you do your risk assessment you take into account what your business can and can't introduce and implement what is reasonable and feasible uh, and within that uh, risk assessment you then pull out of that a a, a plan uh, one two three pager depending on how long and how, how uh, complex it needs to be and you communicate that with your employees and you get them to 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 sign up to it um, cleaning of the workplace again um, dependent on what environment that you are in you may already have rigorous cleaning activity but if you don't then it's good practice to have uh, a, a cleaning rotor in place uh, which is uh, heightened given the current coronavirus so again this should go into your plan PPE uh, well if your company or if your activity already requires you to wear PPE that's that remains so um, you know sprayers in spray shops need to wear the PPE however uh, at this point in time there's no guidance at all to suggest that people should be wearing uh, PPE outside of their normal work PPE so you don't need to be providing them with uh, goggles gloves masks if you do not want to if you wanted to offer face masks as part of your plan uh, and your employees are saying we would feel a lot more comfortable if we wear them in the office that's entirely up to you but it's not uh, dictated uh, that you do that uh, especially if you are taking lots of other precautions as well in terms of making the workplace safe um, and then uh, the last one here on this slide is safety and welfare. Um, th this is going to be, I think, quite a big one because um, for all of us on the call that are business owners or business leaders, um, it's we can't wait to get back, to get back to normal, to start to get the business back to normal and start making money. However, we must understand that not everybody thinks in the way that, that we think. And some people out there will be more concerned with safety so a, a return to work uh, for some will be scaring them to death um, there will be some people out there and and, and um, you know we can't hide from it but there is a, a, a we hope a minority of people out there that will be not wanting to come back because frankly they don't want to come back and they like being off being paid 80 percent in the sunshine um, and um, we have um, people out there that, that uh, have genuine concerns over the workplace, et cetera. So, so there's a whole range of people who uh, just because we say, hey, great, we're returning to work, may not want to return to work. And then the last um, batch of people here that, that we'll mention and, and you need to be aware of are, are people that may be suffering from a level of anxiety um you may know 
already that they've been suffering from anxiety therefore they'll be on your list of people that that, that you need to have a double check over but there also may be people out there that have developed anxiety or depression or some form of mental illness during this lockdown scenario and and rather sadly uh, i think there'll be more uh, people than than you would think so uh, how do we cater for that well look let's not assume that the that on a friday you say let hey let's go back we've cleaned the premises down we've got our plan great look forward to seeing everyone there monday don't assume that everyone's going to be on the same boat and they're going to be relishing the fact of jumping back to work so the more work you do prior to the return to um introduce people back to the idea of returning the better uh, so our advice would be with, with uh, a reasonable amount of notice, keep people in the loop, tell them what your intended plans are, tell them that you're working for a re-entry plan, um, inform them that, look, we're considering X, Y, Z as options when you come back, uh, complete your risk assessment, send it out to employees, ask for their feedback, ask for their input, get their buy-in. Um, talk to individuals as well so uh, you know if, if you have a, a reasonably small num number of te team members um you know talk to them on a one-to-one -one. hey how are you doing look you've been on um on furlough now for five to six weeks eight weeks whatever the time frame is um how are you feeling uh, are you relishing coming back are you worried about coming back understand what those individual needs are um because when we get back to work and again we've got a bit more information on this in a, in a moment um ultimately people who refuse to come back to work for good for no good reason ultimately you could end up disciplining however um you need to bear in mind and take into account every single indiv individual circumstance because if you haven't done that already disciplining somebody who potentially is suffering from a high level of anxiety for slash depression could actually leave you pretty open for a claim. So uh, aside from defending against claims, let's make sure our employees are um, have plenty of notice, are consulted with over your plan to get back. And on that basis, you're gonna have far less pushback when people um, are coming back than you would do if you simply said, hey guys, uh, it's Friday afternoon, good news, we're back Monday. Um, right, okay. Um, I think next slide, so okay. Returning staff from furlough. Okay. So um all so you you've got employees on furlough. Um when you place them on furlough, uh hopefully you will have written to them. Um the guidance uh, has changed regarding writing to them. If you have written to them, uh, brilliant, uh, you're definitely safe. If you haven't written to them, um, I don't think that's going to necessarily be an issue because I think uh, the government and HMRC have since agreed that look, if, work, if, if, if employees have, employers have just sent people home, as long as they are paying them the 80%, they should be okay. However, going forward um uh, if you have written to them if your um initial furlough time period was to the end of may just double check your letters and you want them to stay on for longer than may you're going to have to write to them to extend that that furlough period um and uh, the guidance we're giving our clients is and the letters we're producing actually then don't have a time frame on so that it's not open-ended so uh, anyone on the call that hasn't done that and you need to extend furlough, uh, drop us a line and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, provide you with an extension letter to, to the scheme. Um, now, returning from furlough, similarly, you have to provide reasonable notice. Um, it's not a legal entitlement. So uh, if you have a sudden need to bring somebody in off furlough, um, you can do it uh, however guidance is the more notice you provide in bringing somebody off furlough the more buy-in that you're going to have um, just a quick note the furlough scheme uh, you, they needed to have been on furlough for three weeks in order for you to claim if you pull them off furlough 
after the three weeks for a day or two uh, and you uh, have them doing paid work, that's fine. You can pay them for those two days. If you want to put them back on furlough, that's also fine. But then they'd need to be on furlough again for a further three weeks for you to claim. I think the majority of people now who uh, have been on furlough have been on for far greater than three weeks. So you should be fine. But but bear in mind, if you've got people six or seven weeks, eight weeks on furlough, you bring them in, you've broken that furlough period. Um, you can bring them off for any period of time. It could just be a day. You can place them back on furlough, but then they need to be back on for three weeks or more to claim. Um, on returning people from furlough, you should write to them confirming that you're requesting for them to return. Um, that documentation is going to be required down the line if HMRC ever to get round to auditing your business. Um, so again, we do have a return from furlough letter for you should you require it uh, and also a return to furlough letter as well if you require that. But let's assume for this moment in time, this is all about coming back to work. So, you know, I've got 10 people on furlough. I don't need them all back at the same time. Can I, um, you know, can I, can I pull some and not others off? Yes, you can. Um, but as I've stated at the start of this webinar, um, if you uh, are pulling a, a number of people back, you need to go through a certain level of criteria in order to select the right people. So this is all based on roles. So if you um, yeah, are making roles up again, but if you have uh, three chefs that are furloughed and you want to bring one chef back, you need a justification for why you're picking a specific chef to return. Um, and as long as your justification is made based on the role or the skill set or the expertise that they have, rather than the fact that it's just Dave and he's a better egg than the other two because if you do a pain in the backside, then you're absolutely okay. And again, we can help you with the justification. It's not as as, as difficult as, as as perhaps I've made it out to sound, but you do need justification, fair and consistent justification for selecting who comes back. Interestingly, I'm not sure um, who will be more fed up, the guy that you're bringing in or the people staying at home, <laughs> dependent on who you select. Sometimes it's, well, hold on a minute, I'd rather stay on furlough for 80%. Why are you picking on me to come back? Which is rather bizarre, but um, it comes down to knowing your people as well again, I, I, I guess. Um, the If you uh, don't need to bring all of your employees back, uh, at once, then the furlough scheme is there and is designed to deal with exactly that. So our advice is that if you've got longer term confidence in the market coming back uh, and you believe that your existing workforce will continue to be your existing workforce, but um, it's going to be a bit of a gradual um, climb back to normal uh, revenue levels, then our advice is use the furlough scheme for that purpose. It's exactly what it's there for. It's great to be used for that purpose. But bear in mind, you've got 80% uh, of, of ability to claim 80% of salaries up until the end of July. After July, uh, you've then got a, a, a few months where they will continue to allow you to use furlough, but on a uh, continually declining basis. So they're going to encourage you to start getting people back to part time or you will have to pay a percentage of their furlough. And the reason for that is, is that the government is saying by that point in time, you need to sort of make your decision in terms of whether you need these people or not. Um, but it's there to use if you need it. Um, if um, you're looking at it saying, well, actually, look, I know now that um, I'm not going to need all of those employees. Our advice at this stage is um, don't wait till the end of furlough. We, we've spoken to a load of uh, people who have said, uh, well, whilst they're paying furlough, I might as well keep people on it uh, until the end of furlough. Well, you can do that. Are you going to get in trouble for that? Doubtful because you're not making people redundant. But bear in mind, when furlough drops, uh, the employee returns to work and then if you need to make redundancies at that point, uh, then it's on your watch and they're on your full pay. And um, if you're paying out redundancy figures and, and notice, etc., 
uh, it's all at your expense. Whereas if you know that you need to make redundancies now, you can uh, go through that process fairly and consistently. And whilst there is still furlough available, uh, they can be working their notice through some of that furlough, which means, means you can reclaim some of that notice pay from the government. So uh, whilst it's a job retention scheme uh, and we're not encouraging people to make snap decisions of making people redundant, um, what we are saying is if you know it's, an, it's inevitable, uh, the sooner you do that, the less cost it is for you as a business owner. Um, Again, just reiterating as well, um, the um, if if you can uh, arrange working from home options, again, I need to keep stating this. Then it, it, it's something until we're told otherwise, you need to continue to be making that decision. Um, and we believe that um, you know if there's going to be any challenges anywhere with this whole thing, it will be people coming back saying, "But I can work from home. But I can work from home." So if it if, it, if it's not possible uh, to do that, or you've got significant concerns with people working from home, again, make sure your justification for not allowing people to work from home holds up and is fair and reasonable. And again, if you wanted to run that past us, we'll give you our honest opinion, whether or not we believe you're going to be able to stand by your decision to insist people coming. But working from home is gonna be a big challenge. Um, so uh providing yeah providing people with with notice as i say uh, if, if there is a sudden burst in um in demand uh you don't there's no actual legal requirement for you to give people notice for them to return however the more notice you give people the more likely they are to be comfortable with returning and the only other thing that we'll say is you do need to take into account people's situations so uh, for example, um, if the employee has currently got childcare issues because they're caring after two young children and the nursery is still shut, if you turn around to them and say, we want you back in tomorrow, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to do that without leaving their children to fend for themselves in a day. And it would be unreasonable for you to demand them to return on that basis if you know they have those types of issues. Um, if they are currently self-isolating or shielding, again, um, you can't enforce them to come in. Um, so it, 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 dependent on the individual uh, will depend on whether or not notice is, is something that, that can be held to or not. So our advice is, again, know your individual circumstances uh, and if that means you know one-to-one -one calls with them to find out exactly what where they stand what their concerns are what are the restric restrictions with returning to work if it happened next week is really really helpful because then can that can form some of your justification as to why you've asked dave to return and not mandy to take two names out of a hat right so um and and that's absolutely fine mandy we haven't asked you to return because look when we spoke last week you said that you had significant childcare issues and you don't foresee that changing for another couple of weeks so therefore we haven't selected you with us dave because dave can can bounce back tomorrow with no concerns um but uh, ultimately uh, if you can plan to provide notice especially when you're talking about reopening the business then the more notice the more conversation the more dialogue the better um, in addressing concerns of employees, um, you will get, I'm sure, a number of employees that are anxious or concerned about returning to work. Uh, and again, taking time to address their concerns is the key. So a lot of them will be uh, around, is it safe to return? Well, the only thing that you can really do there is to uh, get them involved and talk to them about the, 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 the health and safety plan for returning to the workplace take their specific concerns on board um, if they are um, high risk uh, or their partner has been advised to shield for 12 weeks because they're extremely high risk uh, then you need to just take extra special consideration for for their concerns and um, again there's a balancing act in terms of whether it's reasonable to force somebody back in those situations um, and again what our advice to you is uh, 
it may be a requirement for you to, to request that somebody who has a partner who is shielding should return, but uh, just get some advice and guidance and, and on, on doing so, uh, as it's a little bit more delicate um, than uh, than perhaps somebody with none of those with none of those concerns. Um, what if it, what if an employee refuses to return? So I mean, ultimately, um, we've actually provided and, and and again, if you if you need it, just just drop us an email. We, we've got a bit of a flow chart, which is quite useful in terms of going through all of the reasons why somebody may or may not want to return. Ultimately, if an individual has um, no good reason not to return, um, so they're fit and healthy they don't have any underlying health concerns um they are just generally concerned about the coronavirus and they don't want to return ultimately you can force them to return and if there is a refusal to do so you can either put them on unpaid leave or uh, in extreme cases potentially discipline them so we would urge caution with the discipline route only because um I think most people we need to assume they may have a genuine concern however it is a possible route if you do have people that are just point blank refusing to attend work so um, ultimately that that's available to you but along the way before getting to that point there's a whole world of um, scenarios that, that you're going to need to take into account before you can decide what action is appropriate on getting them to return um, but one thing's for sure, um, you are going to be incredibly fortunate if you turn back to your workplace and you ask everyone to come back and everyone jumps in, skipping and jumping and happy to be back. That is utopia, uh, but probably not reality. Um, OK, next slide. Uh, changes to terms and conditions. So. Um, this is the question that we've been asked an awful lot. Uh, and um, so the question is, uh, can I make changes to salaries, job roles, working hours, shifts, commission, bonus structures, et cetera? Can I make those changes? The answer to all of that is absolutely yes, you can. However, you need to follow uh, due process and follow a legal process in order to do it. But should you be considering these things? Um, well, if it's, uh, if it's a requirement for you to get your business into the shape that it needs to be in to survive, absolutely, yes, you should be doing these things, albeit, yes, of course, they're difficult. Yes, of course, they impact on people. They're not nice things to potentially do if it, if it means that somebody's uh, salary is going to reduce. But 100%, you need to be weighing this up. And at the very least, putting your desired outcomes down on paper and then talking them through with someone like ourselves to say yeah look if you want to achieve this this is what you need to do in order to achieve it and this would potentially be the cost this is potentially the outcome if it goes down this route so that you can weigh up whether it's worth doing it but don't miss this opportunity to reorganize and reshape your business um, if you believe you need to so quick answers to these now so can i make changes to salary well um it, it, you you can but uh, not without going through consultation so um you can make changes to people's terms and conditions that are reasonable changes without the need for extensive consultation and the need to actually potentially place somebody's role uh, at risk of redundancy if they refuse the, the, the changes. However, these are normally in changes that aren't necessarily significant. So for example, a slight change to a shift pattern, uh, for example, a slight change to a job title or a slight change to uh, holiday entitlement are all contractual changes that you can't just do without consultation. However, uh, if you, uh, make those slight changes, consult with the employee, explain the reasons why you're needing to make those changes. For, for, for many of those minor changes, you can probably safely enforce them through giving due notice as they aren't significant changes and, and, and unreasonable changes. However, 
significant changes to shift patterns, uh, any change to remuneration, bonus, commission schemes, etc. Uh, and when we're talking commission and bonus structures, we're talking contractual bonus schemes and, and, and commission structures, not, not, not non-contractual. Any, any contractual changes like that, we would suggest to you that they aren't reasonable for people to just assume people should accept them and therefore you need to go through a process and that process is here's our justification business for justification for wanting to make these changes it is necessary that we make these changes for xyz reason um, we're hoping that uh, you accept those changes uh, but if you don't accept those changes, the alternative could be that we need to make your role redundant on its current terms and conditions and we'll make it available again on the new terms and conditions. Um, so in other words, you're, with, with anything that's a significant change to contract, you, you're following a redundancy process um, with the hope that people accept the new terms and conditions and don't actually accept the redundancy. However, you need to be prepared for people saying, no, thank you much, I'll take redundancy. So that's changes to salary, job roles, working hour shifts, commission bonus structures. So in answer to that, um, if you want to make any changes to, to any of that, I would sketch it out. I would write down and capture your best case scenario. This is our ideal plan consult and get advice on whether or not those changes would be classed and deemed as reasonable or not and some of the consideration will be reviewing your contracts as well because there's some contractual stuff that might allow you to do things and um although there's there's always an argument even if it's in a contract whether it's reasonable to enforce it or not but but ultimately find out what you want to, ch to, to change get advice in terms of whether it's going to be deemed reasonable or not um, get advice on what process you need to follow, timescales, etc., in order to try and drive it through. Then make your decision on whether it's worth doing it. Um, and if it's worth doing it, get on with it and 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 um, and get on with making the changes because this is the one of those opportunities out of this horrible mess that that, that is a is an opportunity for you to reset your business and get it to where you need to get it to. Um, so considerations um with all of this stuff it's it's the, the biggest consideration is what is my business justification uh are the changes that i'm looking to put in um they may well be favorable to the business but are they fair and reasonable for employees to even consider um are we treating people equally um is this based on roles not individuals again so it's not just uh, I'm picking on Dave because he's a pain in the neck. So I'm going to ask him to take a 20% salary drop. You know, it needs to be justified equally and fairly and consistently. And if all of those answers are yes, 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 then absolutely you can get on with making the changes as long as you follow careful process and consultation and be clear. But you need agreement before before moving on. A good example of this, actually, I work for a manufacturing company. Uh, once upon a time it's actually in the last recession 2007 and we were reducing uh, headcount across five plants in Europe and uh, one particular plant um, we were asking for 20% uh, temporary salary reduction um, and we ran a check in that particular plan on average salary levels in the plan and then average cost of living in the area around the plant and on doing so, we worked out that if we actually enforced the 20% salary reduction, we'd be actually putting people into a negative situation where they potentially couldn't afford their rent or average rent and bills for the area. So um, we didn't actually go ahead with the 20%, we reduced it and we tailored it for that particular plan. So it's just an example, uh, Don't you, you need to do your research. Um, because trying to force changes through that wholesale um, unfair and unworkable could could drop you into a bit of trouble. A bit of an extreme example, but I thought I'd share that with you. Um, next slide. Redundancies. Okay, so um, re so it, redundancies can happen for several reasons. One is um, through restructure. So you need to restructure your business, you need to become leaner, you need to become more efficient, uh, you've devised 
a, a way to remove a department and increase another department, et cetera, et cetera. And, and on doing that, you may find cases to make roles redundant. And it might not be driven by a headcount reduction. It might be, as per the previous slide, you need to make changes to terms and conditions that are, that are unreasonable to force through. So you need to give people the option of taking redundancy if they don't accept it. It could be that actually you need the same number of employees, but you need to change where what departments they work in and what job titles they have. So uh, you're not looking to make reductions of employees, but you are looking to make significant change. So redundancies can happen in that case. But also redundancies can happen simply because you're looking at the numbers and you're saying we've got 10 employees, we're not going to be profitable unless we have five, therefore we need to lose five roles. Um, the key with redundancy, um, especially in, in the UK and, and uh, for those of you who have worked um, for or with American companies, this can sometimes be confusing because it, 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 it's not the case in America, but um, when you're looking at redundancies you're always looking at job roles and not individuals who are carrying out the role so when you're looking at your structure it's best advice to take all of the people's names off the structure and just look at job roles so if you've got i don't know five marketing executives uh, and uh, you've worked out that you need three ultimately you've got to go from five marketing executives to three Therefore, you have to put five marketing executives at potential risk of redundancy in order to select three through a fair and proper uh, selection process. Um, so names do not come into this. Um, some people ask me, well, yeah, OK, fair enough. But if I know I've got two people that are a complete pain in the neck and I want to get rid of them, can I skew the redundancy process in order to make sure those two get made redundant? Um, yeah, it's possible, right? But you need to consult with uh, with someone like ourselves in order to help you through that process, and that's off the record. But ultimately, it's about roles, not people. The key here is business case. Um, so um, the, the, everyone at the moment that's talking to us is saying, "Yeah, well, I've got a key business case. It's the coronavirus. That's one part of the business case." So for your business, yes, the coronavirus is here. It's had an impact on your business. That has then led you to look at needing to restructure, but then you need the next level business case, which is, and the reason why we have selected the marketing department in this example is because X marketing activity has gone down, bum, 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 bum. So there is a next level of that business case. So the more work you do on making sure you've got a nice rigid business case, which then lends itself to pointing towards certain roles that may need to be made redundant, the stronger your case is. So once you have that, the process is relatively straightforward. You uh, you identify the employees uh, that, that potentially need to be put at risk. Sometimes the number of people that you have to put at risk is far greater than the number that actually potentially will be made redundant. And that's because of what we've already said, that sometimes you need to pull individuals. So if you want to make two marketing executives redundant out of five, all five need to be put at risk to make two redundant. Um, you um, make the announcement. So once you've got all of your ducks in a row and you've got your, your business justification sorted and you've got the exact number of employees that you know are going to have to be put at risk, you need to make an announcement um, um, and write to people to, to, to notify them that potentially their role may be made redundant. You then enter into a period of consultation. This is the key to a fair and consistent redundancy process. So um, consultation is a process of the company discussing with the employee the justification for the redundancy and giving the employee a fair and reasonable time in order to challenge the proposal and come up with alternative solutions, firstly, and also to support the employee with potentially redeployment, whether it be inside or outside the organization, uh, and to answer all questions that they may have around their redundancy package, proposals etc etc so consultation is really key um, if you're making less than 20 people redundant in a 90-day period it's simple individual consultation so you're writing to individuals say your risk your job is potentially at risk and we're entering into consultation with you as an individual on that scenario consultation lasts as long as it is meaningful um, 
However, typically between two to four weeks for an individual consultation period is normal. If you are looking to make more than, well, 20 or more employees redundant over a 90 day period, then regrettably you have to go into what is known as collective consultation. And that means that you have to arrange for uh, elected representatives to be nominated. So you have to hold an election which takes between one to two weeks. The elected representatives are nominated and then you enter consultation with the elected representatives for at least 30 days. Um, so for 20 to 99 employees being made redundant, it's 30 days. 100 plus employees, it's 45 days. So you consult for at least that period of time. And at the end of that period, you then commence consultation on an, on an individual basis. Uh, so potentially that whole process has just been added by a month and a half. Now, if you're really good at consultation, you have a great relationship with the elected representatives, they could give you uh, the go ahead to start individual consultation within the collective consultation period, uh, but not always. So bear in mind, if you're looking to make 20 or more redundant, collective consultation could come into, into play. Um, and then selection, so so um, on selecting what roles are made redundant, you need to follow a fair and consistent process, which could either be an interview process or a scoring matrix process, but you need to uh, make your decision based on um, fact and obviously nothing that could be classed as discriminatory. Um, Notice, so at the end of the period, once you've selected the roles to be made redundant, there's obviously two bits to the redundancy package. There's a statutory redundancy payment and there's also notice. Uh, dependent on your circumstance, you sometimes can uh, give notice of uh, the, uh, the, the role being made redundant and therefore they work their notice. So at the moment, given that people are on furlough, we're helping companies to arrange worked notices so that you can claim a lot of it back. Um, albeit, although alternatively, sorry, you can you can pay in lieu of notice. Um, um, the statutory redundancy pay is tax and I free. Notice pay and any accrued holiday that's been untaken is also due at the end. That's also taxable as well. Um, those individuals that um, get a or opt for a suitable alternative role um as part of the consultation process so yet yeah, my job as marketing executive being made redundant however um i've been offered a job as a, um as a, as a sales assistant and i'm taking that up will automatically get a four-week trial where if they decide during or after that four-week trial that it's not for them they can say look actually can you make me redundant it's not working for me okay so that's redundancies um next slide what next okay so i've run over a little bit so my apologies for that um so um we uh, as a result of this 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 webinar uh, everyone that's that's logged on will get a free copy of the webinar you also get a questions and answers sheet we'll go through some questions if we have any in, in a moment um you'll automatically be placed on our mailing list if you aren't already on it uh, to receive ongoing information updates our monthly newsletter um, if you want to be removed from it, hopefully you won't, then there is a simple way of unsubscribing on the on the email that comes through. Uh, if you're not seeing newsletters come through, check your junk mail because our newsletters come through um, a third party and sometimes they can be forced into your junk mail. So as soon as you put them into your normal mail, then you should receive them. Any advice, guidance, support you want, because I'm it's a webinar, it's all one way. I've covered probably a fraction of what you want to cover. Give us a call. It's a free consultation. Those of you that are clients, you, you obviously ring us at any time. But but those that aren't clients on the call, free consultation. Um, prices uh, are from as little as fifty pound a month, depending on the number of employees, uh, or ninety pounds an hour. But but bear in mind, free consultation up front. Um, for her further advice, support, uh, email us, drop us a line, etc. Um, so. Other than that, have we got any questions, Zoe? I've rattled on, uh, but I don't know if there's any questions that have 
popped up? No, we haven't had any come through. So um, we will um, put together anything that we think would be really helpful for you. Uh, and we'll drop the flow chart out as well that Duncan mentioned earlier around um, where employees are refusing perhaps to come back to work or have got some concerns over that. Um, and any other tools obviously that we think will be helpful to you. In it, as Duncan's already said, if you do um, think of anything actually that you'd like to ask that you haven't, um, please obviously feel free just to, to give us a call. Um, think it, well, you know, we, we'll be able to help you with that or just drop us an email with your question uh, and we'll get back to you as, as soon as possible. Okay. Good stuff. All right. Well, look, thank you very much. Apologies. I've rattled through. Uh, always difficult on these things. You think, oh gosh, I could have covered X, Y, Z and I could have talked for hours. But um, hopefully that was of some use and uh, give us a shout if you need anything else. Thank you for your time. Have a good day.